My name is Frank Dirks, and I'm just delighted and uh, honored to welcome uh, everyone joining us for this call with, uh, with Peter Blyer um, today. Uh, Carolina Catholic Professionals has been doing, you know, these Zoom calls here now for, uh, uh, you know, since uh, September, and I, we are learning from this and uh, learning how to do it better. Uh, this call will be, uh, is being recorded, and um, I'd ask everyone who's uh, joining us to, uh, to stay on mute. Uh, Peter's graciously uh, offered some time at the end to answer any questions that folks may have, so we'll certainly um, um, provide time for that. But uh, as always, we just wanted to start with a with a prayer, and um, you know, certainly a prayer for uh, for bringing peace to uh, uh, to the hearts of so many in our in our republic today. But uh, if you join me in um, uh, a hail Mary, in the, name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Carolina Catholic professionals, we have uh, three goals. Um, um, that we always try to state um, we're here to support the church. Uh, we're here to support each other as Catholics and Christians in the world. And we are here to proclaim the gospel in the way we live our lives. And uh, increasingly that is, uh, uh, is a challenging thing in this world. Certainly uh, Peter's gonna address that as it relates to the medical community. Um, but um, you know, these are opportunities for us to come together and remind ourselves uh, what it means to uh, be followers of Christ and um, how we can help each other uh, live the gospel. So with that, I'm delighted and honored to, uh, to introduce everybody to, uh, to Dr. Peter Blyer. Uh, he starts off by, uh, uh, and it makes me proud as a dad, but he starts off by saying he's a father of five, and uh, that's a wonderful thing. There's nothing better than that. Uh, he has uh, served our republic uh, in the United States Navy, and he is uh, a board-certified family practitioner who spe specializes in wound care. He's a uh, catalyst for uh, preteen um, uh, pre-confirmation, sorry, pre-confirmation pre teens. Uh, and he's also the president of uh, the Blessed Clemens uh, von Galen Guild of the Catholic Medical Association. He's the medical director of the Coastline Crisis Pregnancy Center. He loves to cook. Uh, he, uh, as all good doctors should, uh, is uh, passionate about, uh, out, about exercise and uh, has been a, a contributing writer for uh, the American Thinker. So uh, I'm delighted, honored, and uh, privileged to have this opportunity to introduce you to uh, Dr. Peter Blyer. So thank you. Peter, take it away. Thank you so much, Frank. It's such an honor uh, to speak with you all. Unfortunately, I don't get many opportunities to speak. Um, there isn't a big desire for the teachings of the church. And so I, I really appreciate this opportunity to do so. So I titled my talk, uh, Being a Physician uh, During COVID. For this I was born, and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice, from John 18:37. For me, this is the summation of what it means to be Catholic. The COVID uh, pandemic has just been such a good example of how the faith or the destruction that comes about the faith when the truth of Jesus most authentically found in the Eucharist is hidden from, from Catholics or difficult to access. Many physicians, many of my colleagues like Dr. Fauci backed by government officials and media outlets have deliberately created an illogical COVID fear affecting even the church hierarchy. Tragically, in the face of this unjustified fear, the church has voluntarily agreed to limit access to its most valuable weapon in the fight against the evil that's coming about because of COVID. The Eucharist from the catechism, the Eucharist is the source and summit 
of Christian life. If that's so, COVID must be the dam and the avalanche. Prior to COVID-19, every week in the US, roughly 10 million Catholics received the body of Christ. This is based on 2017 data from the USCCB and Pew Research. Hundreds of millions of lost sacramental opportunities have left America deaf to the truth and opened the door to the evil that's come about because of COVID. Every Catholic has a role in the battle to save this country. As a Catholic physician, my calling is to follow and promote the example of Christus Medicus or Christ as physician, while doing my best to point out the destruction inherent in the very prevalent religion averse style of medicine promoted by people like Dr. Fauci. From John 5, 15, uh, 5, 5 to 14. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been ill for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stir stirred up. While I am, I am on my way, someone else gets down there before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take your mat and walk. Immediately the man became well, took up his mat and walked. Now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to carry your mat. He answered them, the man who made me well told me, take up your mat and walk. They asked him, who is the man who told you, take it up and walk? The man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away since there was a crowd there. After this, Jesus found him in the temple area and said to him, look, you are well, do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse may happen to you. This is an example, obviously, of Christ as physician. And for me, this is the example that I follow. The physician in ideal medical care follows a one-on-one -on -one doctor patient relationship, always doing what he feels is best for the patient, not only from the physical, but the mental and spiritual perspectives. With limited outside interference, the doctor has the freedom to do what he feels is best for the patient, while also requiring the patient to be intimately involved with his care in terms of both finance and compliance. This is an authentic, invaluable, trusting relationship based on truth and genuine concern for the patient. It does not ignore the financial costs of such a relationship, but requires a delicate balance between concern for the patient and the financial aspects of the practice. One needs a well-formed conscience to balance this. And we see in the world today, it is not well balanced. It is an approach that has been extremely fulfilling for me and for most of my patients, but it is a model from which the medical community has increasingly distanced itself from with destructive results. One of the missions of the Catholic Medical Association of which I'm a part is to promote Christ-like medical care as the answer to the woes of the current healthcare system. The foundation for such care, which should be no surprise to anyone, is respect from, for all life from womb to tomb. And it's something a doctor should understand better than anyone else. Sadly, the greatest obstacle to instituting a Christus Medicus medical approach is the per growing perception of American population that not all innocent life has equal value. Many will mouth platitudes about life having value, but their expressions express a sentiment in which some lives are simply more equal than others. Just as there are many politicians who are willing to sacrifice human life for political gain, there are many doctors who are willing to do exactly the same. Which always begs the question to me, if you are willing to sacrifice human life for political gain, what won't you do 
to meet your goals. To these people, truth is simply another obstacle to overcome in their quest for power and wealth. As Frank mentioned, I'm a board certified family practice physician. So I'm very familiar with the American Academy of Family Practice, which is the leadership organization uh, for family practice physicians. In May, 2019, they joined the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists and three other large medical organizations to issue a press release. Frontline physicians call on politicians to end political interference in the delivery of evidence-based medicine, which was their response to limits placed on abortion by different state legislatures. In it, they complained that limits by these state legislatures inappropriately interfere with the patient-physician relationship and unnecessarily regulate the evidence-based practice of medicine. Their premise, as I mentioned before, was that not all life has equal value, especially unborn family members. As a family practice doctor, I have, well, I have multiple offices or multiple exam rooms. In exam room one, I will have a 20 year old, 13 week pregnant, healthy woman. In room two, I will have a 20 year old, 13 week, healthy, pregnant woman. And the direction from the AAFP, as in many of these other medical organizations, is I go into room one and that life has no value because the father says so. And I go into room two and that life has value, even though they're exactly the same. For the unborn lives of higher value, the mother and child become patients. And as it should be, the physician's responsibility is to do his best to ensure a healthy delivery. For those of lesser value, the doctor is directed not only to walk away from the doctor-patient relationship, but moreover, to enable the child extermination. Despite the public statement, this statement that they put out, a uh, grandiloquent description of family physicians as informed by their years of medical education, training experience, and the available evidence, None of that is considered in the final decision about the value of an unborn family member. It is rather the often flawed analysis of a distraught teenage girl with a SpongeBob level of medical knowledge that leads to this life or death decision. Without ever providing a rationale, the AAFP, like these other big medical organizations, Strip the family physician of his role as a true advocate for every pregnant mother and her child. They are, of course, unable to defend this position based on medical ethics, which is the highest medicine's highest standard. So they choose rather to highlight abortion as evidence based medicine. And God knows it's evidence based medicine. If you go into the womb of a woman and rip the baby apart, the baby will die. That's evidence based. However, rather than interfere with the doctor-patient relationship as these organizations claim, recently passed laws mandate the establishment of such a Christ-like relationship with a child whom doctors would otherwise have cruelly and unethically chosen to discard. Like so much of the propaganda we receive, it's exactly opposite of what the truth is. They're trying to destroy the doctor-patient relationship with the unborn child while claiming that it is not meant to be a doctor-patient relationship. COVID illustrates yet again that to more and more of the country's elite, including politicians, physicians, and even some of our bishops, that lives have different value. Since 1973, the United States has averaged over 1 million abortions per year. The same politicians, physicians, and bishops who have been advising the country to take extraordinary, unprecedented action like closing churches and limiting reception of the Eucharist to save the elderly feel little obligation to take similar steps to protect unborn lives. To date, there have been about 340,000 deaths attributed to COVID, although for many, it is unclear whether they died from COVID or with COVID. Abortion deaths have no such question. Over the last year, approximately 700,000 Americans have died from abortion. 
looked at in terms of years of life loss using average age of death of COVID to be 75 and life expectancy in America to be 78.5 years equates to 1,190,000 years of life loss through COVID, while 54,950,000 years of life have been lost through abortion, making each year of life lost through COVID equal to the life of a 45-year-old. This gruesome discrepancy, highlighted by the fact that billions of dollars have been spent to, per to preserve these golden years, while billions of dollars have been spent to destroy the years of the unborn is a tragedy of unspeakable magnitude. It further illustrates sadly, the lack I feel of, of desire on the part of the church to finally rid the country of abortion. We have been told since the presidential election of 1976 that barring pro-abortion politicians from receiving the Eucharist was too drastic, which although I disagreed with, I understood because of the power of the Eucharist. Yet in the face of COVID, we immediately prevented 10 million American Catholics from receiving the Eucharist, exposing to me the insincerity on the part of our position on pro-abortion politicians. As a final illustration of the fact that life is not viewed to have equal value, I would ask you this question. If abortion as a solution to 700,000 problem pregnancies is something Catholics can live with, does this mean execution of 700,000 illegal aliens annually as a solution to illegal immigration is something we could also accept? And we know the answer to that. Another obstacle to Christ-like medical care is the intimate association between big medicine and the sex industry. As I have grown in the faith and been open to Jesus Christ, I have been made progressively aware of this association. I went to medical school at Wake Forest where I met my wife, a lax Episcopalian at the time who has since uh, become a very devout Catholic. I bought into all the illogical lies of the Catholic contraceptive crowd. Makes me laugh today to think I was so narcissistic that I thought I knew better than St. John Paul. I bought into the stuff that these old men, they don't understand sex. They don't understand medicine. They don't know what they're talking about. But now how foolish I realized I was. The man who so eloquently stated a nation that kills its own children is a nation without hope is so, so true. I mean, it's being proven so correct. My wife and I were married in 96, graduated medical school in 97 and began a residency program at St. Vincent's, a Catholic hospital in Jacksonville, Florida. We contracepted and freely prescribed contraception. My unease with our lifestyle led me to go to a Catholic Medical Association meeting one night. And I was naive enough to go to the presenter to try and justify my prescribing practice. He, he was very kind. He looked at me and he said, you won't be doing that for long. And he was 100% right. My wife and I stopped pre prescribing contraception, learned natural family planning, and uh, really changed our lives. But it was interesting, the reaction that we got from the residency program. It was as if hell had frozen over that we no longer prescribe contraception and we were at a Catholic hospital. <laughs> For over 10 years, I used my religious views line as my rationale for not prescribing contraception, which the new US Navy seemed to accept more openly than the other organizations I have worked for. But it was an indication that I really didn't understand what it means to be a Christ-like physician because it gave people the impression that if I was not a Catholic, that if I did not have religious views, I would prescribe contraception night and day. I would not. So after 10 years as a Navy physician, my wife and I settled in Myrtle Beach with our five children, and I began work in a solo hospital and practice 20 minutes from Myrtle Beach. Meanwhile, my doctor wife was and continues to be a homeschooling mom, for which 
I am very appreciative. A patient I had been taking care of for some time in this practice came to me one day. And uh, as part of his visit, he said, um, I need a higher dose of Viagra. And so it, this was something I prescribed routinely. Uh, took about 30 seconds to do. But as I was doing it and get ready to sign the form, the electronic form, I thought for a second. I said, I, and I, I thought of his wife, who was also my patient, who was hemiplegic after a severe stroke. And despite my years of political correctness teaching, I couldn't help. I said, you're having that much sex with your wife? And he laughed at me. He said, oh, no, doc, it's not with my wife. And I, before I could do anything, I let out, well, then Viagra is not for you. So he stormed out of my office. I don't know if it was related, but a few weeks later, an executive from the company I worked for came in and said, your business numbers are low, which they were, and we're closing your business. But I always thought that that probably had something to do with it. But it made me realize that the reason, or let's see, uh, it was after this that it finally dawned on me that the real reason it was wrong for me to prescribe contraception was not just because of my religious beliefs, but because it was bad medicine and no further explanation should be needed. I don't have to claim, for example, religious beliefs to explain why I don't prescribe anabolic steroids to young boys or Xanax to young girls. How does prescribing a contraceptive to a young woman so she can fornicate help her physically mentally or spiritually? And what does it really have to do with medicine anyway? How does prescribing an old man Viagra so he can have an affair, affair help him physically, mentally, or spiritually? And what exactly does that have to do with the doctor's job to prevent and treat disease? Well, once again, it showed me that the church's teaching on artificial, on artificial contraception is based on very rational thought, not as part of a list of prohibitions. From a medical standpoint, contraceptives do not benefit physical health, and by weakening families and marriages, they are strongly contraindicated for mental and spiritual health. I have seen firsthand the direct benefits of natural family planning to my marriage and my family. As a good doctor, why would I not want exactly the same? for my patients. This is some of the ludicrousness that's involved with medicine. It's very important to keep in mind also, as I learned from this experience, that religious belief is just another term that progressives have cleverly co-opted to devalue the convictions that are consistent with orthodox Christian values. If a physician, even if he is an atheist or an agnostic, believes life begins at conception, homosexuality is disordered, or abortion is murder, he is dismissed as a religiously driven zealot attempting to impose his religious views on others. If the physician, on the other hand, believes that life begins at some other time, gender is fluid, or abortion is great, he is considered a mainstream doc. His views are considered not to be religious and are therefore considered to be of greater importance. Unfulfilled in family medicine, um, I left the field for wound care, which has allowed me to a much greater extent to serve the Lord as a Catholic physician. But if, even in this field, there are obstacles for Catholic physicians. A few months back, after having worked six years in the Conway Hospital Wound Care Center, I was released without cause. An executive from Heologix, a large wound care company, stopped by my office on a Friday afternoon, handed me an envelope, succinctly relayed the news with a short and sweet, the wound care center is headed in a new direction and quickly departed. <laughs> this is common medical speak for you're not bringing in enough revenue, which may never be verbalized as it conflicts directly with what administrators are programmed to verbalize, which is it's all about patient care. The required delicate balance between concern for patient and financial success, I mentioned earlier, 
was destroyed in 1965 with the new medical discovery about the beginning of life. No longer at fertilization, doctors now declared that life began seven days later at implantation of the embryo in the uterus. This new beginning was based not on Nobel Prize winning medical research, but rather on a desire to cash in on the contraceptive pill, which sometimes prevents a human life from implanting in the uterus. It was much easier to market a contraceptive than a combination of abortifacient contraceptive. Over the intervening past 55 years, the simple, elegant, Christ-like doctor-patient relationship has been invaded by vultures desiring to profit. Government, insurance companies, billers, coders, medical suppliers, and others under the guise of improving healthcare have been allowed to add layers of bureaucracy and expense, and in effect, have had a disproportionate negative impact on the healthcare, especially of middle-class people. The medical community has allowed this takeover in an effort to profit. It has led to physician dissatisfaction and forced physicians to leave private practice for big and personal organizations with the currently very expensive law ordered administrative support necessary to practice medicine. Doctors were meant to practice, especially family practice, were meant to practice in solo doctor owned or group doctor owned practices. But because of the administrative burden from insurance companies, government, computer system, they just can't afford to stay in practice on their own. So they're forced to join big groups. My father had a private practice in Rhode Island and he stayed there until he died. He practiced in that location for 40 or 50 years and his patients loved him. And that was how it was designed to be but you just can't do that anymore because you can't afford the expenses. And so it really hurts how the, pro the, the provider provides care and really hurts the patient. Removing third parties from the doctor-patient relationship is just another essential aspect of restoring healthcare. So using this background, what is the Christus Medicus approach to COVID? Excuse me one second. As with all the diseases, as with all diseases, the physician must learn among many other things, who is affected, how the disease is transmitted and its resultant morbidity and mortality, advising and treating patients accordingly. It is not the one size fits all approach which people like Dr. Fauci and government officials with universal roles universal rules and lockdowns. These rules are promoted on the idea that physical health is everything. Little attention is paid to mental health and spiritual and to mental health. And spiritual health is condescendingly looked down upon with the importance of a hot dog bun. Patients wishing to make informed decisions on how to respond to COVID who disagree with authoritarian physicians and government officials are shamed as selfish, inconsiderate, unpatriotic, unchristian malcontents. All the while, the population has limited access to helpful information. If an 88 year old with multiple medical conditions actually believes John 658, this is the bread that came down from heaven whoever eats this bread will live forever and wants to attend mass, he should be able to. Or if the same 80 year old feels his mental health concerns override those of his physical health, such that he wants to be with his grandchildren, my job as a physician is to provide guidance that helps him mitigate his physical risks while also helping him with his mental and spiritual health. Physical death, especially as Catholics, we know is not the end. It's the passage. As of January 6th, or for example, let's look at one group of Americans. As of January 6th, 600 Americans under age 24 have died with COVID. In 2018, 
almost 2,500 teens in the United States, age 13 to 19, were killed in motor vehicle accidents. Why don't we outlaw motor, vehicle acts, motor vehicles for teens? Why do we allow them to make decisions about driving vehicles? Why are, is the United States House of Representatives, why did they pass a bill legalizing marijuana? Implying that it's okay for our teens to get stoned on marijuana, but they're not smart enough to make decisions about who they can associate with because of COVID. They can't go to a football game because of COVID, but they can smoke as much marijuana as they want. At least this is what the House bill that was passed, uh, I believe in November said. Young people's spiritual and mental health is much more at risk than their physical health. I think it's tragic that young people are being dispensed from their mass obligation. Young people need the faith as much as old people and preventing them or telling them they don't need to attend mass just hurts me tremendously. The most ludicrous example of COVID rules can be found in something I really enjoy, which is college football. My oldest son attends Clemson. My oldest daughter attends Alabama. So there's a little bit of conflict in this house. Not so much right now. But anyway, if you look at COVID rules, no, let me see. Uh, as coaches and players make a mockery of the scientific and idolatrous government ritual of mask wearing, maybe we should ask if healthy young men who play a game in which brain injuries, broken bones, and joint dislocations frequently occur, should really be concerned about COVID-19. A Google search of athletes who have been hospitalized or died with COVID finds only one, a 20-year-old 6'3", 355-pound overweight football player. Even in this tragedy, it is unclear from official reports if this young man died from or with COVID. What is clear, however, is that virus policies which allow players to go maskless as they huddle on the field, but require masks when they huddle on the sidelines, have little to do with Christ-like medical care or savings lives. COVID's purpose is to create a fearful and obedient American population. If the medical community were really interested in helping to allay the fear of the American population regarding COVID. There's one simple, well, there are a number of things they could do, but I've always thought one simple, very simple thing to do would be to have a database that any American could look at, which would list age, height, weight, medical comorbidities, and how many people with those attributes have died. This is something that the government collects on a daily basis and it would be readily accessible. But it's these type of things that are not being told to the population, which leads to fear. People are not fearful if they have knowledge, but when the knowledge is withheld from them as the medical community, the big medical community appears to be doing, in combination with uh, media companies, uh, it's very difficult. On Monday, I packed up the rest of my office in Conway and left the sad place I had so much hope for. Neither the hospital nor Heologics felt the need for any parting words. My boss of six years was out, but she relayed her graciousness by word of the head nurse, make sure you leave your badge. The meaningful words came from patients and staff I had worked closely with over the years, leaving me again feeling blessed to be a physician. It turns out that age, at age 60, I am still learning about my own inadequacies and what it means to be a Catholic physician. Despite personal setbacks and my concern for this one great country, I am overjoyed to have my faith in Jesus Christ. There is great comfort 
in knowing the truth and joy and doing my best to live it out. That's all I got. Peter, that's very, very powerful. And uh, thank you for your, thank you for your witness. And um, I, I, there are lots of questions I have. I'm sure other folks have questions too. Um, um, I, I mean, personally, I, 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 I want to just kind of ask how, um, how are you looking for other options and all that stuff? I mean, what do you see for that? Well, I, I've already set up to work for a, a new company. I'm going to be doing virtual wound care and I hope eventually to start my own practice. But these big organizations, you're forced to join them because if you don't join them, you can't continue to work. And then they force you to sign contracts that are very difficult. So for example, I have a non-compete clause for two years to practice wound care. So it's this type of thing that's very frustrating that was never meant to be part of medicine. But this is when we sold ourselves out to big medicine, these are some of the results that have happened. But I'm very blessed. Um, uh, I've My wife and I have saved sufficient money. We're, we have no financial problems and we're very, very blessed. So have no concerns from that standpoint. In fact, it, it turns out that it was a blessing because I was just getting very frustrated by the and the frustration comes from the fact that you, you want to do what's best for the patient, but the business is always trying to get you to do the procedures that cost the most. So we have a, a hyperbaric chamber and that generates a lot of income where, where patients lie in the hyperbaric chamber, but it's very tightly regulated. And the push was always to get people in the chamber, even in my medical opinion, when they didn't need it um, to, to make money. Now, and I do understand the need to, to make money because there is so much cost in medicine. Uh, so it's not like, it, it, it's a di very difficult ethical position, the need to make money, because if you don't make money, you don't stay in business versus the need to do what's best for the patient. Well, everything you've touched on, um, you know, touches on ethics. And uh, I, I, broadly, I'm kind of curious. I mean, how, how does the medical community come together to define, you know, its standards for ethics? Um, I, you, know, you know, I know just in the last week or so that the, uh, the California insurance industry um, uh, has, uh, has, has redesignated uh, double mastectomies uh, is a is it a approved procedure for uh, for teenage girls uh, who have uh, gender dysphoria? Um, is, is, the, is there a process by which the medical community you know forms you know an ethical framework that that would push back at any point uh, you know as these things start to develop? It, there's very little pushback because it's kind of like the liberal viewpoint of how to run the government is you get in position and then you ignore what other people think or what other people value. So the American Academy of Family Practice or Family Physicians, they just don't care what the physicians think. Um, I've, I, I've never been to any of their meetings to talk about these things, but from what I understand, you just don't have the opportunity to, to present this kind of information. So really there, you would want, if we were led by a Christ-like medical community, that's exactly what you would want. You would want an ethics conference or some type of ethics panel uh, to discuss these issues, but there is not such a thing. So there's no, there are no voices within, no, Lisa, jump in there. Uh, well, first of all, Dr. Blair, thank you. This was a wonderful um, representation of your experience and, and of your faith. And I was really inspired by that because it's, um, I'm sure it's really difficult, uh, you know, to, I'm just sure it's really difficult in every walk of life to be practicing your faith. And I think medicine is certainly one of those. But um, as the, um, I'm the mission leader at Roper St. Francis Hospital, uh, Roper St. Francis Medi uh, Healthcare System, and I'm at St. Francis Hospital, which is the um, Catholic hospital. 
And I just wanted to, to say that we are very blessed here because of the ethics committee that we have and because of uh, Roper St. Francis recognizing the ethical and religious directives for Catholic healthcare from the bishops so that uh, although we're not a totally Catholic system, the whole system is aware of and considerate of the ERDs. So, um, you know, I'd love to, you know, hear, you know, have this discussion with you, but um, in the Catholic- If, if I could just interject for just one second, if you could, uh, an ERD, if you don't mind, just- Oh, the ERDs. So that's the Ethical and Religious Directives for Catholic Health Services. And it's a document that the US bishops routinely re revise. And um, it's, it's been around for, you know, about a hundred years in very um, initial forms. And then it has grown into a, um, a body of directives um, that really help guide um, Catholic medical providers in what the, the bishop's uh, recommendations are, what their, what their directives are and how to address various um, different topics everything from patient uh, doctor relationship to beginning of life issues, end of life issues, even to the very end of it, which would be the um, how healthcare, Catholic healthcare systems now operate and partners with other than Catholic healthcare. So um, it's a document that I would recommend to everybody's reading and I can give you a link to it so you can put it on your on the website. But, um, and it would take a, you know, about an hour to go through it um, and, uh, but, but what that does tell, what I want to say about that is, you know, there's guidance and, um, and especially in Catholic hospitals, they um, pretty much mandate that we have an ethics committee that looks at all of these different issues, beginning of life, end of life, even transgender procedures. Now they all might not always end up where you think they're going to end up, uh, but it does give you um, a theological um, and scriptural background that the bishops have given us to stay within guidelines that helps us um, do patient care. Um, I don't, I don't know how other, other than Catholic hospitals do it. I'm sure it's community hospitals that do it differently, but um, it's been a real blessing to us here at St. Francis to be able to have um, a, an ethics committee that will take up any question like this and compare it to the ERDs. Is that helpful? Yeah, yeah. We, we do have, and I was talking more big picture, the, our hospital does have an ethics committee and, and, and they, do, they do good work. So, you, and I understand the, the Catholic religious directives, the medical directives, um, but big picture in organizations like the AAFP and the AMA, they're very averse to, to discussions of, of ethics or they have discussions of ethics, but they're so one-sided. Um, they're, they're just very one-sided. Mm -hmm. so th thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Well, if I, I could just jump in, I mean, in that, I mean, as, um, and again, I, 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 I regret I don't have the specifics of the, uh, the California insurance thing, but I just use that as an example. I mean, the, the notion of, uh, you know, the state uh, directing insurance providers to approve a procedure that, you know, has a significant lifetime implication for a young person that could be, you know, made by that young person conceivably without, you know, parental permission if the young person is under uh, the age of majority. If something like that were to come down either, you know, in, in, in uh, the non-Catholic, you know, environment that you are, Peter, or in the, you know, the system you are, Lisa, I mean, how, how is something like that handled. I don't really have a good answer for that one. I haven't have never been had to deal with with something like that. Um, and it gen generally tends to be specific to that community. So I know or specific to that medical community. So being in wound care doesn't it really wasn't affected by that. So that wouldn't be something that come under our purview. As a family practice doctor, um, what would happen? It's hard to say what would happen. Um, I would claim, um, uh, I, I would just say it's bad medicine and, and not do it. And that would be my approach. And then see where the chips will fall. Progressive or increasingly, um, your 
ethical opinions on things are less and less valued. So I think earlier in my career, um, if I believed that contraception, uh, I didn't want to prescribe contraception or I didn't believe in a medical procedure, I, I wasn't forced to do so. But I think increasingly with directives that come out like this, uh, the companies you work for are forcing you to do these things or they're punishing you. And they're either punishing you by uh, having you see multiple other patients or, uh, or, or just plain letting you go. Uh, you, before Noreen has a question, but did you want to jump in there, Lisa? Well, um, they, they, issues like that do come up and are grappled with um, at the ethics committee level. And they're, they're fairly involved in way more than I could talk about at this, this point. It just suffice it to say, you have to look at it from a legal perspective, from a, um, from a, um, uh, diversity perspective, you know, from an equal treatment perspective, and then you have to add in the, uh, what the, what, what the hospital's policies are, and it can get very, very complicated, but, um, our, our goal at the Catholic hospitals is to follow the ERDs. Yeah. And if you're a Catholic hospital in a system that has Catholic and non-Catholic entities in it, you know, that might mean that they would have to transfer to a different hospital within the system. So you won't have it at St. Francis, but maybe you could go to downtown Roper. So um, for other procedures, but again, it's really complicated and it would be another whole session that we could take. Yeah, on. yeah. Noreen, you had, a, you had a question, thank you. Yeah, I jumped in a little late, but my question is, I am familiar with natural family planning and as in your history as a family practice doctor, was there ever an appropriate billing strategy where you could have actually done fertility education with, with your family clients or even with young women? Because you don't see that as an option. The women go to their doctors and they're shoved on contraception. And is there an actual billing strategy where a woman can actually meet with her doctor, an NFP instructor, a family practice doctor that would actually really work with her on understanding her fertility. But I don't know if that's ever going to happen in medicine. There, I know a number of physicians who, um, OBGYNs, who do uh, teach natural family planning. And my understanding is, is they, have, they have a billing procedure for it. I'm not intimately familiar with it, um, I was trained uh, in um, the Creighton the Creighton model, and I, I went to Omaha for with um, Dr. Hilgers for his training. But I never had the opportunity to uh, implement the program. But I believe there are ways to bill for it. Um, if you uh, email me, um, I'll be happy to to try and get you more information or in touch with people. Uh, who, who could help you with that billing aspect. Okay, I appreciate that. I mean, we do have a couple, like I know Dr. Nancy Stroud, I just don't know if she does it within her medical billing, but I will email you, thank you. Thanks a lot. We have other questions. Uh, when you, uh, you, you touched upon this, Peter, here um, earlier, here, just the, uh, the, the the dynamic relationship between uh, pharmaceuticals, um, you know, insurance and uh, healthcare providing, you know, corporate entities, and how that, um, you know, and how that puts, you know, physicians at a disadvantage. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that and just how you see that playing out? Could you could, could you say the question again, Frank? How how you would do? Sure, just the, you know, kind of the relationship between, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies, um, uh, insurance, the institutional, um, you know, doctor practices now that, you know, tends to be the trend that you described and, 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 and where that places the physician in that dynamic. Um, well, 
in wound care, it's dealing not so much with medications, but was dealing more with procedures and wound care products. And so what happens with these products is as Medicare, primarily in, in wound care, as Medicare approves different things and based on how much they'll reimburse those particular things, then all of a sudden you'll get a slew of those products. So the, the community, the, 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 um, the pharmaceuticals and the medical products, they respond to what Medicare will pay. So it's not, I mean, it, it, it's, the products are designed to help the patient, but if they had a, pay, if they had a product that would heal a wound in three days, if Medicare didn't approve it or Medicare didn't pay for it, you would be, you would have no incentive to use it except your personal incentive as a physician. I mean, something like that wouldn't even come to market. So everything is, is based on how the government reimburses the company that produces the product. And also whether you use the product in the wound center is based on how much reimbursement you will get. So it's a very, it's a very skewed system, um, as I alluded to before. What, what you would want in the Christus Medicus approach is you would want the companies to produce the best product possible. Then you would want to get together with the patient and say, this is the best product possible. It costs so much money. Um, are you willing to pay for that? And the prices of such products would be a lot cheaper because you wouldn't have to go through these specific reimbursement policies um, and uh, it would be much more of a direct uh, consumer type of thing. And, and so that, that, that would behoove the poorer patients. So the richer patients don't have to worry because they have the good insurance, which will play this system, which will meet the system to afford the most expensive products. I, I don't know if that succinctly answers your question, but that was my attempt. Yeah, no, that's... So what are the voices out there beyond yours? I mean, as you, as you look at the, uh, you were talking about kind of the 30,000 foot view uh, a little earlier when we were talking about ethics. I mean, what are the voices out there that uh, are raising these kind of issues within, you know, the larger policy environment uh, to, to point to broadly ethics and, um, uh, and, and the relationship most importantly to, uh, you know, to, to, to the gospel? Well, the Catholic Medical Association is a strong organization, very fervent, very orthodox organization, and they do a very good job of, of promoting the Catholic content, content. The Christian and Medical Dental Association, not as strong as the Catholic Medical Association, but they're good people as well. And these are different organizations that, that do their, their best. There are some legal, the American Legal Defense Fund, and in, which uh, can help defend doctors who are uh, prejudiced upon for their views, they help out as well. But th those are the main areas um, that I know. There are not a lot of big guns out there um, looking to help promote Catholic type of medicine. What, what, are the, what are the major things that the Catholic Medical Association um, does? I mean, you know, are, is it advocacy lobbying what um, they do what, they do a little bit of lobbying and they do a lot of advocacy they do a lot of training they work very closely uh, with medical students to try and um, help them learn about their face faith and prep be able to practice their faith um, uh, they produce a lot of uh, literature about uh, and, and scientific research about um, medicine from a Catholic perspective, um, they, do, they do a lot of good things. Yeah. Richard, uh, I know you have a question. Uh, real quick, you mentioned briefly about the dominance of kind of the medical field over kind of, well, physically over the, the mental health aspect of what we're going through currently. Why do you think that mental health is kind of taking a backseat to all the efforts and cautions and restrictions and all that why do you think uh like i said why do you think mental mental health has taken a, a second tier to, to all the physical considerations uh because i think that there's an agenda there 
Um, I really think there's there was there was an agenda to get rid of uh, Trump uh, and and mainly uh, the conservative Catholic uh, the conservative Christian voice, um, and it's much easier to promote rules based on physical health and mental health. So, example when they're when they're attempting to put these lockdowns, they talk about deaths. It's all about deaths and all about bad symptoms, you know, because that's that tends to scare people and it tends to be easier to quantify versus, well, some people will get depressed. Uh, these, these type of things I would say are harder to quantify. So I, I think the focus was chosen to be on the physical health uh, and, and less emphasis on the mental health. And I think as been shown by many people, uh, the mental health, especially in suicides and depression uh, has been astronomical. Uh, with COVID. Yeah, I can, I can say just in our small example of our youth ministry here at St. Teresa that mental health is definitely outpacing their physical health concerns right now. And it's actually causing some physical health concerns for a lot of them, but it really starts with mental health. We're seeing a lot of issues with not just the youth, but their families. And uh, I just think it's getting overlooked a lot. It's kind of heartbreaking to see. It, it, it's extremely tragic uh, because these things are all predicted. I mean, these things were easy to predict. Um, and as I talked about, when you see the farce that is, when you look at what they're doing to athletes as far as COVID, you see what a joke this is. For, for young people, it, it's such a tragedy. And, and, and that's why I feel so badly about young people not, not going to church. I just... I, I can't say how important I, I think like the sacrament of confession is for, for young people, for everyone, but it's just so tragic that, that they're not getting their sacraments. Let me ask you real quick, just from the standpoint of the Catholic Medical Association, as you look down the road, what do you see are the big issues, challenges um, that uh, are coming toward us that uh, folks who are not in that um, um, well, you, you, you're, know. more and more physicians are going to be forced to do things that con conflict with their Catholic, Catholic ethics, religious freedom, which was somewhat, um, I, I think, well protected under the Trump administration is really in danger with the Biden administration. Um, so I think that a lot of what the Catholic Medical Association is going to do is, is or what they're going to be the problem they're going to face is this lack of uh, religious freedom. This is this is a big deal uh, in medicine. Um, and then I think, obviously, they're going to be facing just increased push for abortion um, with uh, with the all Democrat run presidency, House, Senate. They're going to get. They're going to force the contraceptive mandate. They're going to force taxpayer funding for abortion. They're going to get rid of religious freedom for physicians. So I, I think that the Catholic Medical Association is getting ready for the great persecution. We have uh, a question from Cheryl. I think this will be our last question. Cheryl, do you want to jump in? Yes, um, I have concerns about the safety of the vaccine. Um, I have a friend, she's a PhD clinical psychologist that participated in the AstraZeneca trials at Medical U. And she said that that particular vaccine is very low cost. It doesn't have the gene alteration that Pfizer and uh, Moderna have, and she didn't have any problem with it. But, you know, I'm, um, I've always been leery of vaccines, especially, you know, how the schedule for vaccinating our kids is just out of control. So I have concerns that um, this whole, that it, about the safety of these vaccines, the long-term results, England, um, them saying that they don't know if, if how it will affect fertility for women, et cetera. What is your take on that? Yeah, I, I would never let my children uh, get this vaccine. I absolutely see no need to it. I, I, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, I think the vaccine is appropriate for the elderly with multiple conditions. But I agree with you. We just don't know enough about the long-term consequences of these vaccines. 
I think it, it weighing the risk versus the benefits, I think it's reasonable for the elderly to take it. Um, I mean, in all likelihood, uh, when you're talking, as I mentioned, the, the average age of death from COVID is 75. The average life expectancy in the United States is 78 and a half. So um, talking kind of. Yeah, I just turned 75. So <laughs> you heard what? I just turned 75. Oh, so it's yeah. kind of a big flag so, up there for me. <laughs> and this is also why I believe in individual freedom. I mean, that's part of what, what, we should be able to do as, as Catholic physicians and, and patients is discuss with our doctor what the risks and benefits are. And we should, patients should be able to make their own decisions on this. It's not, not, not an easy decision. So everybody has to, to weigh the risks and the benefits. So my bottom line is I agree with you. We don't know what the long-term consequences are. Um, but uh, if, as I look at my family, I would have my mother get it. She's 93. And right now we can't visit her because people are afraid of what we can do. So if she got the vaccine, then at least we could visit her. And frankly, even if it didn't work, then at least we could visit her. And I think for her, as in many families, the, the, the children get concerned about the parents and they limit who the parents can see. And the parents deep down are thinking, you know, I don't care. I want to really, I really want to see my grandkids. And, um, this is another aspect of the mental health that's just not being addressed. Um, so I, anyway, I, I, I would have my mother get the vaccine and the rest of my family, I would not have get the vaccine. Well, thank Peter, you. I wanna thank you very much for, uh, for your time today. I wanna thank everybody who uh, joined us for, uh, for the call. We try to stay as close to, uh, to, uh, to our hours as we can. So uh, very grateful for that. Uh, we heard from Lisa Cunningham uh, this morning, and uh, or uh, during during the call, she's going to be our speaker next month. So we're excited about that. She's going to speak from the uh, uh, from her perspective at uh, Robert St. Francis. And uh, with that, I just want to thank everybody again. Um, we are in the midst of our membership drive here, Carolina Catholic Professionals. Uh, I urge everybody to uh, to you know. To jump in, make that uh, uh, that minus fifty dollar uh, contribution. Uh, we're busy trying to do a lot of things. Most importantly, just uh, you know, build and uh, strengthen the network among Catholics uh, uh, in the Charleston area and beyond. So um, please prayerfully consider that, and uh, we hope you'll join us as uh, as members. Uh, with that, thank you all very much, and I uh, wish you well. God bless. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Thank you, too. God bless.